in metal shaping and some of the clients that he's done some stuff for? Oh, this ought to be good. Uh, okay. Well, I started in 1980. I had no idea about metal shaping, much about uh, car design or anything. But much like you guys, I just wanted to have that ability. I wanted to have that, you know, that the, the foresight that it takes to take something all the way through from a sketch to a completed part. So I started out. I started out right into the deep end. I went ahead and started building a car. <laughs> you know, putting the tubing together, that's not the hard part. The hard part is actually bending the sheet metal to the forms that you want. When I got started, <clears throat> nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted to talk about how to shape metal. If anybody's tried to find somebody from like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you heard of a few people that do it. And then you get with them finally, you track them down, and they won't even show you how to do it. Fact is, most of them didn't even know how to do it. It came from another place, but they had this kind of appearance that they knew how to shape metal. So that, went, that didn't go for everybody, it just went for a few people. But uh, I finally tracked down the right way to do it, got on a plane, went to England, went over to AC Cars. There was a guy there who became friends with, uh, Lawrence Kett. And I was walking through AC Cars, buying some parts for a Cobra that I was doing, suspension pieces. Walked through the panel area, and uh, probably a lot like you guys, it, you know, you wonder how to do something and then finally oop, it clicks when you see somebody doing it. And, and it's like, geez, that's how it's done, it's so easy. And then you start working on your method and a lot of guys here have you know, been using the shrinker and trying to get the shapes in and how, the, how that power hammer runs. Well, in England, they aren't into power hammers. They were using English wheels. And when they would have to shrink something, they'd tuck it with a little tool they bring in there and they twist the metal over, makes a tuck just like if you ran the, ran the uh, piece of metal in, tucks it up, and then they'd, they'd pull it together and they'd hammer it out to get their shrink. Imagine doing that all day long. So I started out, Lawrence showed me some things, and it just came so natural, just about like I'd done it for a long time, and it came natural to me. So I felt really good about doing the shaping, came back, the first car I actually built was a 427 Cobra and ended up being Jay Leno's car. He owns it. Um, and I mean, that's a whole story in itself, but um, built that car and then from there I did about, I think we did seven 427 SCs and three FIA 289s. And at the time uh, I was restoring some Cobras and you'd actually, all the parts that I would build for that car could interchange with the originals. They weren't fiberglass body and, you know, some crazy tube chassis. They were exact four inch tube chassis. Instead of going with a, you know, the, the 90 thousandths wall, we went with 120, so they didn't flex as much. But, you know, we stayed with the original shape and form of the car and the suspension and the, and the power, uh, the uh, drive line. Um, after that, I started to get into doing Ferraris and did a number of uh, the GTOs. Um, ours were correct. Everything I did was always correct to the original car because I'd always get a car in, work out a deal with the, with the customer to pattern his car, do the work for him. So that's how I ended up with the 427 Cobra, 289 Cobra, um, the Ferrari GTO, which there's only 36 of them in the world, so you know when the national meet was for the Ferrari GTOs this last year <coughs> in Pebble Beach, out of the 36, you know only 54 of them showed up. <laughs> so it was kind of one of those things that you know people build replica cars and they they try to get them close, but they you know they, they fall down in some areas. I always made sure that everything was as correct as it possibly could be right down to the bolts on it. The last replica that I did was a 250 SWB um, uh, short wheelbase uh, Ferrari, uh, the California Spider. And individually, I'd taken five of the seven national judges for Ferrari and had them look at the car independently 
and they all said that if the car had the right serial numbers on it, it would have scored in the high 90s. So I felt pretty good about it and leaving it all right there. Then I get into building my own things, you know, my own cars. And uh, it led me to a point where, uh, like 20 years later, I started doing uh, Rolls Royces, like the new Phantom. Uh, take it, <coughs> cut it in half, make it into limousine. Did two of those, did two of them as convertibles. Uh, got a lot of patents, a lot of structural patents. Um, then I got into doing, uh, I got a phone call from SVT, uh, Ford Motor Company, and they were just coming out with a new uh, GT supercar, and a fellow by the name of Kip Ewing contacted me, and he's one of the engineers with that group, and asked if I'd like to work with them on doing a special show car. The, the, uh, the, the caveat was that I could have a car for free, but they had no money to give me to build it. So I was uh, I had one of them on order, and it was like a hundred and sixty thousand dollar car. And at the time, I could afford it, but um, I decided, you know, if I'm getting a car for a dollar, why am I buying this car? So by the time I got done with building their car and having the insurance on it that they had to have me put on it, I could have bought three cars. That's how expensive it was to do it to to exact T that, that they wanted that car. So I, I followed their program exactly. And it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how OEM think and how they build panels. Everybody wants everything flowed and fared in in the custom world. Well, something doesn't look quite right about it if you have no seams in it, you know? So they taught me a lot about that and flow and, uh, you know, the rain areas and drip areas, and latching, and soft seal area. I mean, it was it was a great learning experience, and uh, we ended up doing like 65 uh, Ford GTs as GTX ones, um, all to their specification, and I ended up making like 35 different options available because that car was pretty basic. You know, it's just go fast and they didn't have any accoutrements in it, like you know, like a double din system or having a, a nice seat for somebody who's got a little bit wider butt um, or a cup holder or anything. You know, they just didn't have that stuff in the car. It wasn't available. And there was clients that wanted that kind of thing. So we would change out interior colors, the whole vehicle color, everything. So that was, that was a fascinating and fun venture with uh, Ford Motor Company. Got to learn a lot about SVT and how they operate. Uh, really great, but small group of guys that build all those high-performance Mustangs and you know trucks and everything that goes on at SVT. So it taught me a lot, and I was happy about that. But it came to me because of the talent that I was able to gain through the years of running machinery like this. Um, I met Chris, I think, during the beginning he was telling you I met Chris uh, like 15 18 years ago and he was he was really intrigued with the way the power hammer worked and uh, I went over to where he originally worked and saw his capability and he he made this machine that would take toilet paper I think and it would spin it roll it and wrap it so it came in as one product and there was this huge ferris wheel until it finally ends up out the end and everything did something different. And he designed it. And I was just totally amazed by that. So, yeah, if you want to build a power hammer, you know, you can come and look at mine. I had a LK90 with a double head. And it was a machine that's really difficult to find. But I was able to get one, bought it for 10000 at the time. Um, years later, ended up selling it for 50000 uh, You just literally can't find them anywhere. They're, they're incredibly heavy um, and they have limitations where those limitations were taken out when Chris built this machine. Um, I ended up going to a power hammer about 15 years ago and now I use all the different disciplines of metal shaping to do a fender. Like 
this. You know, I I could do most of it on the power hammer with shrinking and, and stretching shape into it. But then I'd take it on the wheel so that I could tighten this edge up and bring it in. I put a rubber wheel on the top. I learned that from Kaz Naraki, uh, one of the best metal shapers on the planet. Um, and uh, got this tight. So I'll use a wheel for something like that, you know, on the shrinker over behind us here, the one that pulls the metal together. That works great for doing little edging or places where you're not going to do a lot of welding. My problem with that is when you shove that metal together, it's in a place it doesn't want to be. And it lets you know that because when you start twisting or bending on it, it's really stiff. If you weld like two panels together, you butt weld them together, you'll see it. The, when you start hit putting the heat down, that heat affected zone starts shaping that metal all over the place. You're like, geez, I just ruined my panel. But shrunk metal is all it really is. But when you stack shrink, I keep pointing to this machine, but it doesn't have the right tool in it. When you stack shrink, that metal actually goes <laughs> up just a lot like forging. It goes up, brings it together, and shoves it down. Up, brings it together, shoves it down. So it just ends up being thicker and thicker and not thinner, like when you hammer something. And it'll bring your edges over. So there's a couple ways to do panels, where if you do it with an English wheel, it pretty much is run it through the wheel until you've stretched it to the point in a linear fashion to where that, that, that thing is like a day of working on to get a, a really nice roof panel. And that's with another guy. Now, you have to have somebody on the other ed, end of an English wheel, um, for most people, uh, Kaz Naraki is one of them that you, you don't have to. He's one of those inventor guys like Chris <laughs> who made parts that would hold it while he was wheeling it. Uh, incredible. And there's actually a book this guy's got. You, you really got to get this book if you guys are into this. What is the name of that book? Impossibilities in Metal Shape. Yeah. I think you even have a copy of it. You copy should bring that in after so people can see that. This shows you all kinds of cool ideas in making these little trinkets to form different different sheet uh, areas of metal. But anyhow, um, the, the one thing about the power hammer is that it runs at like four times the speed of what you can do with a wheel. And you can control it a lot better, and you don't need another person on the other end. Because you can take a large panel and run it through like this if you had to. Okay? Where with a wheel, you're stuck doing this. And if you don't have somebody on the other end, it'll take that shape. As it dives off the wheel, it'll start taking that shape and all of a sudden you end up with this, you know, a fender, when you really wanted a, a hood panel. So you have to have somebody on the other end. They have to know what they're doing. They have to track with you. So teaching that to somebody on the other end and let you be the driver and, you know, you can control it. They can start to learn how to do it. You can get it raised pretty easily, um, but it still takes some time depending on what kind of shape you want. Just to give you an idea, Everybody knows what a cobra is, right? Okay. So, uh, how long do you think it takes to make one of those things with an English wheel? Just like if I had the panels cut out and I just shaped them, ready to be trimmed and welded together. But just to that point, I would probably have... Six weeks? Uh, maybe three days. I can build all those panels with only a power hammer. So if you're in the business, like I am, and uh, time is money, um, I don't run that machine in the middle. I run it at its very peak, at the largest, highest end of it, wide open, wide open, which caused problems as it went along, but solutions and how to make it better. And it created a stronger and better machine that Chris figured out how he was gonna make it stronger and better, and he did. So now the machine does what, you know, it, it always did what you wanted to do, but I would run the hell out of it, you know, and- That's I, why I gave it to you. Yeah, <laughs> and I would snap the springs on it. So um, when I run a machine like that, it's not, something that you should just jump on and try to do that because you'll blow your finger off if you get stuck in there. There's no recovery from that. That thing is hitting really hard and uh, you know, 
it'd just be it didn't look like a piece of metal. When that thing's in power hammer mode, how how heavy of a blow do you think it? That it's hitting like yeah. when it, like I'll crank it up to she's wide open right max. Here. You know, yeah. I like hitting it hard. Yeah, it's, it's you can't move the metal fast enough for me. It just you know, once you get to the point where you're moving it back and forth, you want it to shake. I mean, that's what you want to see. You want to see that metal come up. But that that is something that comes over a period of time of working with that machine to where you can actually run at that level and shape panels uh, you know, really quickly. There are different ways to shape panels. You know, like I said, sometimes people will just stretch things to make them come over like this. You know, they'll just run it until they stretch it, or they'll hit it in a sandbag and then they'll punish it off by using a wheeling machine. This piece, um, it's not done, and uh, you know, I just wanted to show something that showed an arc and a little bit of a, of a, a ducktail to the back of it. Um, but I mean, there was like an hour and uh, 20, 30 minutes in making it to that point, you know, and making it so that it was fairly smooth. Um, what I thought I would do is just show you real fast, basic, you know, making a pattern and then how a pattern gets transferred to metal, and then how it becomes that. So what I did was uh, 